Friends, I, do you remember Job? We are, we have been studying the Sabbath school uh, on Job. And uh, there is, I don't know if the, uh, the, the quarterly will address this particular topic. And so that is why I am, uh, I want to start with you uh, on the next uh, few Sabbaths, this, this uh, a, a short series on the holiness of God, the holiness and sovereignty of God, the majesty of God. And uh, because that's what we see in Job a lot. And I think that when we come to understand and come to see God's holiness, God in his holiness, I think that it speaks loads, speaks tons to our hearts and to our lives. And I think we'll be able to see uh, a, a God in a different light. And I hope that, that you will be able to see that. And one of the things that happens to Job, that man in the land of us, right? Um, he's, his name was Job and he was blameless and upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. That's what we read in Job chapter one, verse one. But Job was a believer. He was a guy, a guy that would believe in prayer. He was, he was a devout uh, Christian, if you would. He was a devout Adventist, if you wanted to take it. So he's, he refined his devout believer. And he says, and, and I'm thinking, surely he knew what God was like. Surely he knew uh, he had a taste for the majesty of God. He, ta- he knew what... Um, what, what God was like when his holiness and everything. But um, then came the pain and the misery and his spiritual and physical uh, troubles. And in the midst of Job's darkness, uh, God has spoke, spoke in his majesty to Job. And, and I think, you remember that phrase, is, is, I find it really interesting because even in the Hebrew has a has a bit of a physical connotation. Remember that when uh, when God finally, almost at the end of the of, of all the discussions between Job and his friends, he says, uh, "Job, okay, you ready? I'm going to speak now." And he tells Job, "Job, in the good English, we hear, gird your loins, so fasten your belt, gird your loins." Okay, we, we see gird your loins and it sounds, oh, gird your loins. It sounds so, so pure, so nice, so clean. But I want you to, s- to picture this in 21st century uh, English. Do you like football? What do men use so that they don't get hurt that bad? They use a bunch of things, but there is a particular thing that they use. They use a cup. Is that what it's called, right? Okay, this is God saying to Job, Job, put a cop on, okay? Because I'm gonna mess you real hard and I hope you take it well, okay? Gird your loins, make sure you take this because this is tough to get, this is tough to hear. And see, I, I'm sorry if, I, if, if you could offend it by this um, uh, very vivid <laughs> language, but I, I really, Want you to, I don't want you to miss, in the old English, we tend to miss the raw and the earthy language of the Bible. And so this is what God says. In other words, Job, roll up your sleeves. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right now because I feel a little hot. But I want you to see exactly what, uh, y- hopefully you don't, you don't forget this. And I came without my jacket today because I wanted to show you this. Roll up your sleeves. We're going to get here and see, and, and, and see if you can argue with me. Uh, God says, uh, let's see if you have any arguments against what I'm going to say. And see, this is what God says to him. And I, I'm going to read a few verses. Just listen, because I'm reading a few verses uh, that I put together. Will you even put me in the wrong, Job? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like this? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low. And tread down the wicked where they stand. 
then they will also acknowledge you. That your own right hand can give you the victory. Who then is he that can stand before me? Who has, the given, who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So do you see that? Have you, have you come to reflect on, on this aspect of God? See, for some reason, God is not presented as a woman in the Bible. There are some, of, some illustrations, like the chicken that gathers the hens, right? Like the, the hen that gathers the chickens, I'm sorry. Um, but you, 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 you get the picture. And the reason, the reason I, I, I believe that God is not portrayed as a woman in, in the Bible is because men are, are supposed to be the strong ones in society, right? And, and, and you women know very well that's just kind of out there, right? But in, in, in reality, it's you that are the strong ones, right? Would you, would you women say amen to that? <laughs> it, that's kind of how, how it, uh, Pastor, right? It, 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 that's that's kind of right. <laughs> so, and and the reason there is he's he's saying you know he's portrayed as a strong uh, man, and so he says. But listen, listen to, to to reflect a little bit on what he says. Will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that I that so that you may be justified? So in other words, so that you, are, you, you, you have something to bring to the table, so that you, you are justified for your, your, your sinfulness, for your, your, your complaining to me because you're suffering right now. So, w- so that, oh, you want to find an answer. You want to make sense of this all. So you want to you wanna take me and, and define me to the very nitty-gritty, and that... I won't move around a lot today, so we'll just. So, see, I think that it, there is a danger uh, that we get into, and, and usually this happens in our Sabbath schools, and sometimes when we are uh, topping, particularly in the topic of the great controversy, and this happens to us Adventists. We try to define and bring God so low, so low to our reality and to our human understanding, and even worse, to our 21st century understanding, and even worse, to our American 21st century reality, that the biblical picture of God is, is, is taken away, it disappears, it fades away. But God has shown himself as the king, as the all-authoritative king, who has... N- to, to not to give an account to anyone. He's sovereign. He's above everyone. And so, he said, look, look what he says. I mean, even, even our own will is put to shame. Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Can you do that? I've done that to nature, God says. I've done that to nature, flowers and everything. I've done that to this. Look at everyone that is proud and bring him low. See if you can do that with, with, with Nebuchadnezzar. Can you do that with King Nebuchadnezzar? Can you bring him to his knees before me so that he can sing and say, Hey, I, I was stupid. I did not understand. I thought this whole kingdom that I built it was mine, but it's not mine. And, I, and the, the Lord does according to his will in Above in heaven and in the inhabitants of the earth, the inhabitants of the earth as, uh, are, are reputed as nothing. That's what Daniel 4.35 says. And so, can you bring a sinner to his knees? Can you do that? God says. And tread down the wicked where they stand. They will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you the victory. Who is then that can stand before me who has given to me that I should repay him <laughs> so 
now we understand what grace is. Now we understand what mercy is. God is not paying or giving us anything. We have no right to salvation. We have no right to anything. That is what the Bible says. He presents himself that way. And so if you say, oh, yes, I believe in the Bible, but I'm, I, I want to bring God down here to me, and I'm the one who's going to pay God. I'm the one who, who says, Lord, I pay you my tithe. Lord, I will, I, will, uh, I will do this for you so that you can do this with me. And that, and, and I'm just mentioning tithe. You can, you can take that to anything. Lord, I'm, I'm coming here. And this is, this is what the whole thing that Joe was going through. He was going through a horrible time. But, but uh, and, and he's like, Lord, why, why, why? I, I don't deserve this. I'm great. I'm good. I haven't been that bad. But God says, I, I, don't, I don't owe you anything. I'm the king. You deserve to die because you are a descendant of Adam. And according to Romans chapter 5, from Adam came death and, came, and death to all. And so we don't deserve. So some, sometimes we have a picture of God that we think that we are more merciful than God is. God doesn't, doesn't owe us anything. Out of sheer mercy and grace, he comes to our lives. He shows up in our lives, and he says, I'm the king. And, and as, as, but the beauty of this thing, listen to this, the beauty of this thing is what we read in Scripture today, um, chapter 57, verse 15. For thus is the Lord, the high and lofty one, who in, inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Well, that, that, what has that? Sure, great, God, you're up there. I'm down here having troubles uh, in the mess that we're in, that our country is in, that everything, there's famines, there's things. Okay, but God says, with him, who, talking about dwelling, right? Talking about the dwelling that he dwells in up high, but he also dwells with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isn't that beautiful? The king is way up high. The king of the universe, the one who owes nothing to anyone, has have mercy on us and has come to dwell among us. He became Emmanuel, God with us, and he decided that he's going to humble some of us and that he's going to bring us down as proud as we are. He's going to come with his Holy Spirit and convict us of sin, convict us of our creatureliness, is that the word? I was, I was reading creature lioness. I was like, my wife is like, that, that's not a word, any Creature lioness. Okay? Of our creatureliness. He's the creator. Are we, are we, do we behave before him? Do we relate with him as creatures? Accepting everything he does? Believing, believing and really trusting that all things work for good? For the good of those who love God? All things, even the bad ones. And Job says, I don't understand. Job's friends said, I don't understand how the bad things, all these things, all this rash that you've gotten, all your, your children are dead, your wife is, 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 has left you. Why then? Then, then Job, God responds and says, yes, I am here. Roll up your sleeves, gird your loins, because I am the king. And so, friends, I want to take you for, to the end of Job. Job at the end, that guy that we usually, as Adventists, and I, 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 I cringe when I hear this verse quoted by, 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 um, by us sometimes, because it's just, we rip it out of the context of the book of Job so bad. So bad we rip it off that, that it's, it's an offense to the rest of the Bible. 
to the gospel of righteous, uh, to the gospel of, of, of grace. And the, that verse is when we read in chapter 1 of Job, Job was perfect in all his ways. Kevin, you consider my friend perfect. And we stay there. We stay there and we don't continue reading the rest of the book because, it's, yeah, it's long and kind of complicated and a little boring. I, I admit it. <laughs> it's kind of hard to get into Job. But see, we take that verse and say, see, hey, wait a minute. God is going to look at us and he's going to look how perfect we are. See, we must become like Job. Amen? And so we take our 2016 Greek-American concept of perfection, which means, which usually is a concept, it's, it's, a, it's a place where we get and then we're perfect. There's no more improving than that. Can anybody get more perfect than perfect? No, right? It's, it's there. So that is our, 20, uh, our Greek concept of perfection. Okay? Hebrew comes or, uh, concepts of perfection. See, the Hebrew, he, Greek philosophy, which is what we usually stand, it's human, it's just raw human, human humanistic philosophy, is that it's, it's stagnant. It's, it's, it's a stagnant type of thing. It's, it's, it's as if we are just get to a point and this is where we need to get. God, what else do I need to do to be saved? Okay, I'm doing Sabbath. Okay, I'm doing tithe. Okay, I'm coming to church. Okay, my children are behaving. Good. What else, God? What else do I need to do to get saved? That, is, that was the question of the rich young, young, young ruler. Lord, what must I do to be saved? God just, Jesus just smashed him with the, with the law. Have you done this? Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you, law goes beyond just the letter of the law. Law goes to the spirit of the law. Have you, go ahead and give everything that you owe. Oh, no, I can't do that. I, I love my riches too much, more than you. See, that was empty law without love before it, behind it going through every, every single commandment. And so then we have, we read perfection, but perfection goes to the very Hebrew, the Hebrew mentality is a dynamic one. We think faith, having faith, I believe something. So we want, we love checking, I believe this, I believe that, I believe, yeah, I believe it. Put it in the back of your pocket. I assent, I say yes, that's it. Actual true faith is the one that says, Lord, I'm not moving until you bless me. I'm not, I'm not moving until you show up in the mist. I have the Egyptians behind me. I have the Red, the Red Sea before me. What did the, what did the Hebrew Israel, people of Israel said? Oh, let's go back. Let's, let's apologize to the Egyptians. Remember that story in Exodus 14? Let's apologize to the Egyptians. Moses had true faith, and he says, no, we're going to ask the Lord what to do. And the Lord showed him and said, go forward, children of Israel. That is true faith. The faith that sustains you in the worst of times, in the midst of death, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of when, when things are not going well financially. That's the true faith. That is the dynamic faith that takes you to, to do good works so that your Father in heaven is glorified. That is true faith. And so is with many other things. And that is why I tell you about perfection. Perfection is a dynamic thing. Perfection is... As you move forward and forward into better and better and better and you never get there because otherwise when you you'll be God, right? And and as and as and as God said to Job, he said, Then then they will also acknowledge to you that your own hand, right, right hand can give you the victory. So if if you're so great, God says, then why don't we all come to worship you too? Since you're so great. And I heard, I, I heard a, a, a very interesting um, pragmatic type of definition for perfection uh, from a guy, um, I can't remember the name, but he's, he's from the, uh, he's a creator. He's the founder of one of the few brands in the world, makes in the world that make supercars. But they're, they've gone beyond the supercars, they do make the hypercars. I don't know if you've seen that, that, that documentary on Netflix, uh, The Hypercars. 
and it's like beyond the supercars. So they're, they're, they're incredible. They're incredibly fast and light, and it's just a crazy technology. And the guy has been making cars since he was young. And so he's from Sweden, I think. And he says, you know, perfection for me is a moving target. Do you realize that? Perfection is a moving target. It's not stagnant. Woe to us if it were stagnant. Perfection is a moving target. So in other words, he made a great car. Now we're going to make a better one. Now we're going to make a lighter one. Then he decided the one, one car, which was one colon one, which meant that for every kilo or pound of weight of his car, there had to be horsepower, a horse, uh, a horsepower. So if he would have had a thousand uh, pound car, there had to be a thousand pound horsepower, which was incredible. It was crazy. So for him, perfection was a moving target. And that is the, and, and the Greek word for perfection in the New Testament, teleios, there is a few, there's a couple of others, but the main one that Jesus used is teleios, which means perfection of purpose. So when God comes to you and to Northwest Church, says, hey, perfect. They're doing exactly, they're in the right track. They're exactly what I want them to be doing. I know they're struggling. I know they, 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 they're, they're lacking resources, but I, I want to teach them to trust me. I want him to continue growing. I want to send him my spirit. He sees the little kids. He sees Mrs. Wagner teaching the little kids, and he says, perfect. That's the kind of teacher I want. God sees everyone who is doing a little bit here, a little bit there in our church, and, and God says, perfect. This is where I want him. And you know why I, 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 I pound on this, on this subject? The reason is because of the conclusion of the book of Job. Listen to what Job says in chapter 42, verses 3 to 6. As he has a completely, Job, after all his ordeals, the guy that was perfect, he says, completely, he has a completely new understanding of God. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. The perfect guy, remember? He was the perfect guy in all his ways. I heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The perfect guy. He repents. Last week, I was in Hammond, and in the Sabbath school discussion, we were discussing verse 1 of Job. And as we were discussing, uh, a gentleman said, we need to, he said, well, Job, you know, he had to grow, and he had to go through the struggles and, 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 and perfect his character and, 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 and look at some of the flaws in his character and continue growing. And so somebody looked back at, at this person with angry eyes and said, what makes you think that Job had any character flaws? Very strong. What makes you think? Where does, where does that say that Job had character flaws? Well, if he didn't have character flaws, if we see the Christian life in terms of what you do, of what you don't do, if you see in the Christian life in terms of works, in terms of, in a legalistic manner, then you miss the entire point of the book of Job. I just raised my little hand. I said, well, these verses where he repents because he was only a human being, a sinner, just like us. He knew God. He loved God with all his heart. He prayed. That's why otherwise wouldn't, he, he, was, he was just, he was a God, he was a guy whose entire trust was in God. God was his best friend. But God had mercy on him and continued and showed himself even a greater 
aspect of him, which was his holiness, his sovereignty. And he said, I will come to you and I will show you. Roll up your sleeves. I will show you what I'm, what I'm like, Job. And that is, why, that is why he says, oh my goodness. Why was I trying to figure God out so much and, do, and, and figure my life? And it, this, is, this is not good. And he comes humbled before a mighty, awesome, majestic, glorious, holy God. And he says, God, I despise myself from even wasting my words in trying to ask you why. I repent in dust and ashes. So, what does that have to do with you today? It has a lot to do, friends. And I want you to see it in the next five minutes. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah really quick, please. We'll close with this amazing story of the glory of God. We will learn seven things about God, all right? You can write them down, jot them, jot them, with, your, jot them with, your, with your pen and your Bible or whatever you want to do. Isaiah chapter 6. This is a fascinating story. It only happens perhaps twice in the Bible where these words are uttered. Here and in Revelation. And it's just a beautiful picture of God. Listen, and grab uh, the Bible in front of you, the pew, and, and just see what, what and I want you to, to see, and, and I hope that we get the same experience that Isaiah had. Verse 1, and we will read until verse 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried, to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the, at the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Friends, only in the book of Revelation, and here you see this picture. I want you to pick up a few things. In the year that King Uzziah died, that is crucial for, to understanding this verse. We go back to Chronicles and Kings. Who was King Uzziah? Uzziah was this proud, lofty, and just proud king who displeased God because he had a proud spirit. He was proud. He was stuck up. He was boastful of his own, and he had no sense of the holiness of God. He had no sense. He went into the, 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 uh, the story tells us that of his death. He went into the sanctuary, the most holy place, the, the holy place, taking uh, the censer that was special only for the priests to do. And he came in and he started offering prayers. And the Lord struck him, and he fell dead. So my first question was, when I, when I read this, this story, I thought, well, hold on. But Jesus points out to David, when, when, when Jesus uh, and the disciples are picking up um, uh, wheat or, or barley or what it was, a grain, from, and the Sabbath day, he points out to David and said, hey, he went in there. Uh, David, don't you remember? David went in there, and he grabbed bread, and he ate it because his men were hungry. So what's the difference between David and King Uzziah, you wonder? Because it's not about what you do and what you don't do. It is 
Do you have a new heart? Have you been born again? Have, do you have a sense of God's holiness? Do you have a sense of God's awesomeness, of God's high and lifted up? Do you have a sense of God's glory? See, David was that man after God's own heart. He knew very well who God was. And so he, f he felt it was okay for him to do that. See, everything, Christian life is not about black and white. There are times when, you, when the Holy Spirit, do you realize this? There are times when for certain situations things are right, but for certain situations the same thing is not okay. And so Uzziah comes in. And he comes all proud and he says, oh, all these priests that I need to go through them and need to, reveal, oh, I don't care about these priests. I'm done with them. They think I have to like come with the sacrifice and all these things. I'm going to pray myself. And so he grabs the censers and he goes and like, and he does his own proud praying. And the Lord says, no, you're not going to do that. You can't come into my presence. You know very well I'm a holy God. I'm a glorious God. You can't come into my presence with this spirit, with this heart. And because of his pride, he was struck death. And so there's no king in Israel. There's no one to take authority. There's n he, God has struck the king, the anointed of the Lord. And so Isaiah is brought to desperation He's horrified what has just happened. And in the midst of trouble and of his feeling of God forsakenness, he says, he, in that year, he sees the Lord in his throne, high and lifted up. And he says, God, he is still enthroned between the cherubim. He's still there. He's still the king. He's still in charge. He hasn't left us. And that is, isn't that what you and I need to hear when things are not going well? That he still has the last word. That Satan cannot tempt us beyond that which we can resist. We, he, he, we need to know that God is still the king. That he has the last word on everything we do. That the, that the love of God compels us. That, that it's okay when our children are having trouble, when we, we sense that their hearts are not there, when, when, when things are not going the way we think they should, we need to know that God is sovereign, that He's glorious, that He's a holy God. We, we need to know that. And so in that year, when Isaiah was experiencing that, he saw the Lord who was in the throne. And I saw the Lord sitting in the throne. And that speaks to God's authority, to... to so the first one I would say is that God is alive. That's not number one thing, that God is alive. We need to know that God is alive, that from everlasting to everlasting, He is God. We also need to know that God is, a, God is authoritative. He was sitting upon His throne. He wasn't, do you, do you realize that He's not busy building the mansions? He's not busy mowing the lawn. We don't find Jesus planting or doing anything. He's sitting on the throne. He's the king. He's there. That's what he is. He's authoritative. Number three, God is omnipotent. The throne of his authority is not one among many. It is high and lifted up. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. In ancient times, and here we go again, in, high, in, in ancient times, when people, when kings had a high throne, the higher the throne and the more majestic the throne, it, the, the more powerful that king was. And so Isaiah knew this, and God speaks to his culture, and he needs to see this. And so he sees this, and he's like, oh, wow, God is really majestic. He has the last word. It's not up to King Uzziah. It's not up to, to the priests who are offering these prayers. It's about God and God Almighty, all-powerful, all-omnipotent, all-authoritative. He has the last word. God is resplendent, 
I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, higher lifted up, and his, and his train filled the temple. Have you seen uh, the brides with the long tails? I, in, in the Hispanic culture, we say that every time, every, every, every girl, every Hispanic girl has the chance to be a princess and a queen in their lives. A princess when they turn 15 in their quinceañeras. They get to be princes and everything's pink, right? And they, they get to be queens when they get married, right? I, I knew very well this wasn't about me when I was getting married. I was just a little guy that's standing there. And, and, and if I show you, when you come to her house and I show you the pictures, she's the one shining, I'm just the guy standing there, you know? It's, it's about the bride. They're the, the American saying, you know, the, you want to be the bride on every wedding and you want to be the corpse on every funeral, you know? You want to be that guy that everyone looks at. You, you're, you're proud. So the bride, and, and usually brides have that long tail. And the more royal, the more wealthy, the more splendor, there is that train, that veil, the long veil. And sometimes they have little children pick up that veil or people, you know. Did you see um, King, uh, Queen Diana's, uh, oh man, that was long, right? It was the same during um, Isaiah's time. The train of his robe filled the entire temple. It was so glorious, so majestic. Imagine that God would came in and cover everything, cover all of us with his robe of righteousness. Yeah. Up there in the balcony, up there in the sound booth, here, the baptistry, everywhere, all our school, all our, all our ten, 10 acres here. The, fill, the, the train of his robe filled the entire temple. The longer the flowing robes in the ancient kings, the longer and the bigger, they show the majesty, the more majestic, the more glorious, the more powerful, the more authoritative, the more omnipotent that the king was. It tells us also that God is revered. And this is, this is a beautiful thing. He says that there's the cherubim that were there. The cherubim were there. Above him, each had six wings. We, this is the only time in the entire Bible that we see cherubim. We don't know what these this, this beings are. But they're there, and they're singing to the Lord. They're revered, and so must we. God, number six, God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Friends, the only time this is done again is in Revelation, when again we see the throne. But friends, you don't hear in the Bible, God is righteous, righteous, righteous. Do you hear that in the Bible? Have you ever read that? Or that God is just, just, just. Or merciful, merciful, merciful. Or that God is love, love, love. Do you read that in the Bible? We don't. But we instead, we read holy, holy, holy. That is that one characteristic that is God himself. It is, about, it is how glorious, how big he is. And so when you come to describe the glory of God and, the, and holiness, we also tend to describe it in human terms. And, and what I've, I've, I'll attempt to do a little bit of that today. God's glory is how holiness is displayed before us, human beings. And so... To only define holiness as being set apart for God. Yes, it is that, but much more. It is that, but actually striving with sin, struggling with sin to overcome it and not let it reign over us. Friends, God is holy. And that is the only thing that is repeated three times. And the, the Hebrew understood, uh, mind understood this very well. When they wanted to emphasize something, they repeated it, they repeated it, and they had important words. For example, you read any story, any story, um, especially the narratives, the stories in the Bible and the Old Testament. If you want to understand what is important, try to understand the words that are repeated. The author, the Hebrew author of the Bible, the different prophets, they will 
They will not miss this. They will put, they will repeat words that are important and they will emphasize them and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them throughout the story so that you don't miss the point. They didn't have superlatives. They didn't have, um, uh, is there, are there superlatives in English? I, I can't imagine. Um, in other words, superlatives means that it, they're, they're uh, very, there is, right? Like, uh, so for example, good, better, or best. That's superlative. Best is superlative. Yes, best. We, we in Spanish, we, we add isimo, like just the one, be bella, bellissima. So that means great. The Hebrew doesn't have that. So what does the Hebrew author do? The prophet? The prophet says three times. One, two, three, four, five times to emphasize a point. And so, friends, the reaction from Isaiah after he sees all this is, oh my goodness, woe to me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then you know the rest of the story. Mercy comes to him. His sin is taken. His guilt is taken away. His guilt is taken away, and he gets pardon. And he knows that he's right with God. Friends, there's nothing. There's nothing in this world worth risking salvation. Amen. Worth risking missing. I want to invite you in this next few sermons that I will that I will preach. Come, go and home and discuss with your family. Next week, I promise I will have. I want to have a few a, a little insert in the bulletin where you will have discussion questions so that you can discuss them with your family, with your friends. Get together between two or three families and discuss the sermon. Discuss the topic. Don't don't. Uh, and always says that 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 some people go home and they on Sabbath afternoon and they they eat the head of the pastor for dessert. <laughs> Meaning that they just go to criticize him. Don't, don't even, the, the, well, you're welcome to do that. I, it won't hurt me. But what I'm trying to say is that go and analyze the sermon, analyze the topic. And, and I pray that as you delve in this topic of the holiness of God, you will be brought with the same sense of utter sinfulness and utter creatureliness before the Creator and say, I am a creature. I must humble myself before him. Lord, do with me as you please. You may take my life now. It's worth anything. You may do as whatever, as, as, uh, whatever you want. God might say, who will go for us? And like Isaiah, you might say, here I am. Send me. The Lord needs you. The Lord needs your ideas. The Lord needs, needs you. But will you come before him? Gaze on his holiness, on his grandeur, on his awesome mercy and grace. Humbled. Saying, Lord, I am far, far, far from the gl your glory. Lord, I want to stand right before you. And I want to serve you for the rest of my life with all my heart, with all my heart. Is that your preference? Amen.